Well, good evening and welcome. It is truly a pleasure to see all of you here this evening. We've pretty much packed this place out, and it is a pleasure to see all of you here. I thank you for coming, and of course, uh, most importantly, I thank Imam Shamsi Ali for being here with us this evening as well. Uh, I begin in the name of the Lord Jesus, creator of all things. Bismillah Yeshua Rab al Kalikul. We gather this evening not to compromise the truth, but to honor the truth. I stand before you as one who believes that every person, the sound of my voice, is a creature of God, the Creator, made in His image. The greatest respect that I can give to my fellow creatures is to speak the truth to them. You do not show love for others by compromising the truth. You show love for God and for your fellow men by speaking the truth in love. With the assistance of the Spirit of God and by His grace, I will seek to speak truthfully with you this evening, and I pray you will understand that in so doing, I seek to show you true Christian love and respect. Now, Christians are instructed by their scriptures to speak the truth in love. This is a commandment to every believer in Jesus Christ. And it is interesting to me that one of the 99 beautiful names of Allah in Islam, I believe it's the 51st in most lists, is Ahak, the truth. We live in a day when our shared commitment to truth based upon divine revelation and God's unchanging character is not shared by many in our culture. In fact, we ourselves are likely to be deeply influenced by the degradation of the secular society around us. Yet there could be no mistake about this one fact. Christians and Muslims believe God has spoken. He has not left us in darkness. He has not left us without guidance, without light. And so we must honor his truth, even when that means honestly disagreeing with one another. I trust our dialogue this evening will honor God by honoring his truth and that it will show the world that Muslims and Christians can disagree yet do so peacefully and with grace. In the brief time we have this evening, we can only present a foundation for further dialogue. You, the audience, will continue the discussion tonight and in the coming days. Two major world religions, their scriptures are definitional to their entire worldview and, interestingly enough, to their relationship to one another. Both religions believe their sacred scriptures are divine in origin. Christians believe the scriptures are sufficient in and of themselves. Sunni Muslims believe the Quran and the Hadith are given for our guidance. Both the Bible and the Quran present laws by which man is to live, which express God's creative purpose and his will for us. So what are the differences and how are they relevant to the resultant claims of both Islam and Christianity? Well, let's begin by looking at the Quran. Muslims believe that these are the direct words of God. They are not the words of men. The Quran says that many books, plural, kutubi, have been sent down to men through prophets. The Quran acts as a guard, a muhaiman, over the preceding books. Some believe that means a corrector a rather than a guard. That's something we might be able to discuss. Now, the Quran presents to us a government-controlled textual transmission, beginning with the Uthmanic revision, uh, the third of the caliphs. This results in a generally unified textual history, as you would expect, in light of the control of the transmission of the text. The 1924 Egyptian edition, viewed by most as the official version in Arabic, I would imagine there are a number of the Arabic Qurans here this evening, and that's seen by most Muslims as the official version. In contrast, the Bible, 40 different authors over the course of 1,500 years, Two major languages, Hebrew and Greek, and one minor language. It's about 12 chapters of Aramaic uh, in the Old Testament, primarily in Daniel. The textual history of the Old Testament, different than that of the New Testament, primarily because the Old Testament, or as the Jews refer to it, the Tanakh, the Torah, the Nevi'im, and the Ketuvim, is passed on through the nation of Israel. So it has a different uh, textual history than the New Testament. The key translation of the Old Testament is called the Greek Septuagint. That's what Christians used. Most of the citations of the Old Testament in the New Testament are found uh, to be taken from the Greek Septuagint. Hebrew and Arabic are both Semitic languages based upon mainly triliteral roots. Many of the terms in Arabic are familiar to someone who reads Hebrew because they come from the same roots. 
Now, the New Testament is written in Koine Greek, the common Greek of the days of Jesus. It's a very accurate language capable of in-depth exegesis. The New Testament demonstrates what I call multifocality. Now, what is multifocality? Well, multifocality is the fact that the New Testament was written by multiple authors from multiple locations to multiple audiences at multiple times. From its inception, the New Testament being a collection of books was beyond the control of any one person or group. This means the early copies of the New Testament were distributed far and wide, resulting in multiple streams of transmission. As a result, we have a rich early textual history that protects the text from controlled, centralized editing and change. Let me illustrate uh, with, a, with a graphic. The initial Gospels and Epistles of the New Testament were written at various places at various times. Some were written for distribution within the community, such as the Gospels, and others were epistles sent to specific locations. Then copies would be made and sent elsewhere. Often Christians traveling from one place to another would encounter a book that they had not heard of before and hence would make a copy of and bring it back to their own fellowship. And though a graphic that would represent how many different lines of transmission there were and how often they were interconnected would rapidly become useless due to the number of manuscripts that would be on the screen, the fact that that complex history of transmission should be kept in mind. Over time, single books would be gathered into collections. This was especially true of the Gospels and the Epistles of Paul. Hence, we have P66 and P75. These are Gospel collections. And P46, containing the Epistles of Paul, all dating from the middle to the end of the 2nd century. These collections would then come together until finally, after the peace of the church in 313, you could have entire copies of the scriptures, such as we find in Codex Sinaiticus and Codex Vaticanus. But the important point to note is the multifocality of this process. Multiple authors writing at multiple times to multiple audiences produced a text that appears in history already displaying multiple lines of transmission. This results in the textual variance we must study, but it also results in our confidence that we continue to possess the original message of Christ. Christians are very open about their scriptures and the history behind them. Here is a screenshot showing my electronic edition of the Nestle 27th edition of the Greek New Testament, together with the information on textual variants provided therein. Any Christian who desires to know where variants exist in the manuscript tradition has a wealth of information available today. Numerous critical editions of the Greek New Testament have been published since the 16th century. In fact, one of the texts I have on my desk there in the orange cover is a diglot with the New English Translation and the, new, uh, and the Nestle Island 27th edition of the Greek New Testament. It's a gold mine of information, and so I have brought another one, and I would like to give it as a gift to Imam Ali. Thank you. Now, there is a major difference between the centralized governmental control of the collation and transmission of the Quranic text and the non-centralized, non-controlled transmission of the New Testament. Let me read some important citations from Islamic history to illustrate uh, the point that I'm making here. Most of you, especially Muslims, are familiar with this text from Sahih al-Bukhari. Abu Bakr then said to me, Umar has come to me and said, casualties were heavy among the Qura of the Quran, i.e. those who knew the Quran by heart, on the day of the battle of Yalmama, and I am afraid that more heavy casualties may take place among the Qura on other battlefields, please note, whereby a large part of the Quran may be lost. Therefore I suggest you, Abu Bakr, could order that the Quran be collected. So I started looking for the Quran and collecting it from what was written on palm stalks, thin white stones, and also from the men who knew it by heart. So I found the last verse of Surah Al-Taba, that's Surah 9, uh, with Abi Kuzami al-Ansari, and I did not find it with anybody other than him. Then the complete manuscripts, or copy of the Quran, remained with Abu Bakr till he died, then with Umar till the end of his life, and then with Hafsa, the daughter of Umar. Then in the very next section of Sahih al-Bukhari, uh, section 510 we read, Hudayfa was afraid of their, the people of Sham and Iraq, differences in the recitation of the Quran. So he said to Uthman, O chief of the believers, save this nation before they differ about the book, the Quran, as Jews and the Christians did before. So Uthman sent a message to Hafsa saying, send us the manuscripts of the Quran so that we may compile, compile the Quran materials in perfect copies and return the manuscripts to you. 
And so the process went on, and then later it says, and when they had written many copies, Uthman returned the original manuscripts to Hafsa. Uthman sent to every Muslim province one copy of what they had copied and ordered that all the other Quranic materials, whether written in fragmentary manuscripts or whole copies, be burnt. Now, this is a key issue in regards to the Uthmanic revision taking place about 20 years after the death of Muhammad. Now here is a, a, another interesting quotation from the ancient sources. Ibn Abi Dawood wrote, Many of the passages of the Quran that were sent down were known by those who died on the day of Yamama, but they were not known by those who survived them, nor were they written down, nor had Abu Bakr, Umar, or Uthman by that time collected the Quran, nor were they found with even one person after them. This is one of the early statements that is made. Now this area of discussion is not new between Christians and Muslims. Barely 200 years after Muhammad, a Christian wrote a defense of his faith and took note of the issue of the early history of the transmission of the text of the Quran. Al-Kindi wrote, Then the people fell to variance in their reading. Some read according to the version of Ali, which they found, uh, which they follow the present day. Some read according to the collection of which we have made mention. One party read according to the text of Ibn Masud, and another according to that of Ubay ibn Kaab. When Uthman came to power and people everywhere differed in their reading, Ali sought grounds of accusation against him. One man would read a verse one way and another man another way, and there was a change in interpolation, some copies having more and some less. When this was represented to Uthman and the danger urged to division, strife, and apostasy, he thereupon caused to be collected together all the leaves and scraps that he could, together with the copy that was written out at the first. But they did not interfere with that which was in the hands of Ali or of those who followed his reading. Ubay was dead by this time. As for Ibn Masud, this is very interesting, they demanded his exemplar, but he refused to give it up. Notice that Al-Kindi gives very much the same information regarding the motivation of the Uthmanian revision that is found in Al-Bukhari. He likewise makes reference to Ibn Masud's refusal to give in to Uthman's demands. Tradition relates differing stories about the relationship of Ibn Masud and Uthman, but as we will see, the readings of Ibn Masud remained in the manuscript tradition of the Quran for many years, hence it seems quite logical that given Ibn Masud being identified as one of the premier Qura by Muhammad himself in the Hadith, he would not have given up his copy of the Quran, but would rather have given his life and compromised in such a fashion. Just one more citation from that time period. It is reported from Ismail ibn Ibrahim, from Ayyub, from Nafi, from Ibn Umar, who said, Let none of you say, I have acquired the whole of the Quran. How does he know what all of it is when much of the Quran has disappeared? Rather, let him say, I have acquired what has survived. Now, many Muslims believe the Quran has no meaningful textual history, that the Quran they possess today is a mere image of Uthman's revision. But the fact is that there are textual variants in the early copies of the Quran and evidence of an early editing process seeking to remove Ibn Masud and Ubay ibn Qab's influence from the Quran. Let's look at a few examples so we have solid facts upon which to base our discussion this evening. Here is a variant found in Surah 3, 158. Here is the actual text. I like to blow it up because my eyesight isn't as good as it used to be. Here is the text under consideration which speaks of Allah surely gathering those who have died to himself. Here is the same text from Quranic Manuscript 328 found in the National Library of France in Paris. This is dated to around 100 years after Hijra. 100 years after Hijra. But as reading Hijazi text is hard even for those who read modern Arabic, let's expand the text out a little bit so that you can see it more clearly. Now, what you can see is that the Paris manuscript has an extra olive, not found in the modern printed Quranic text, but in this case, that extra olive completely changes the meaning. In the ancient text, it says that those who die will not be gathered to Allah, while the modern 1924 printed text says they will surely be gathered to Allah. Now, please make sure you understand why I point this out. I am not saying we can't figure out the original reading, but I am pointing out how important it is to have a full unedited, widely dispersed manuscript tradition with which to make such determinations. Hmm. The fact is that there were competing readings in the earliest centuries of the transmission of the Quran, specifically the tradition of Ibn Masud as well as that of Ubay ibn Qab, persisted in the earliest manuscripts long after the Uthmanian attempt to enforce a particular set of readings. This can be seen in the earliest Islamic tradition, for example, in reference to Surah 1793, 
where Abd al-Razak mentions a tradition from Mujahid, we did not know what a house of ornament, zukruf, was until we saw in the Qara'a of Ibn Masud a house of gold, the Hab. Well, here again is the, uh, is the specific text before us, and then we blow it up so we can see it a little bit more clearly. And then we bring up the current reading up at the top, found in the Uthmanian version, and the current 1924 Egyptian version speaks of a house of ornament, zukruf, while the Ibn Masud reading has a house of gold, the Hab. Once again, without the materials destroyed by Uthman, how does one logically and truthfully determine such issues of early variants? Uh, Surah 2, al Baqarah, verse 222, provides another example, this time based upon the Fogg's Palimpsest manuscript. A palimpsest is a manuscript where the original writing has been washed off and another version, or a completely different work, written on the washed leather. Using ultraviolet light, we can often read the original writing. When we read the original text in the Fogg's manuscript at Surah 2, 222, which I have here on the top, and compare the current edition, we see not just variation, we see wholesale editing. Words are changed. The word order is changed. Verbal forms are altered. Grammatical terminations changed, etc. This is clear evidence of the continued attempt, at least a century after Uthman, of ridding the Quran of the readings of Ibn Masud. This is why Sufyan al-Fawri's relatively short tafsir, for instance, can list 67 variant readings, 24 of which are attributed to Ibn Masud. Now, the existence of these textual issues has been well known to Muslim scholars for centuries, but has fallen out of general Islamic recognition, especially in our lifetimes. Uh, here is just one page uh, of many to be found in the 2007 Turkish publication of the Takpapi manuscript, listing variations between the major early Quranic manuscript. These lists are produced by Islamic scholars, not Orientalists and not Christians. And so the first contrast is between a centrally controlled process, Uthman versus Ibn Masud, etc., and the non-centralized, widespread promulgation of the New Testament text, together with the constant search for earlier and earlier manuscripts. Now, as time is short this evening, the second contrast is related to the authorship of the Quran and the Bible. Uh, the Quran claims to be the very eternal words of Allah given through an angel to Muhammad. But at the very least, we can say the Quran has one human intermediary that we can identify, and that would be the man Muhammad. But the Bible has around 40 authors covering a span of 1,500 years. The New Testament has eight authors addressing a number of different audiences over a span of 30 to 50 years. Now, the multiplicity of authors negatively introduces issues of consistency, allegations of contradiction, well, doesn't Paul contradict James, things like that. But positively, it provides a tremendous witness to the spirit-born harmony and consistency of the scriptures when those alleged contradictions are examined and answered. And may I personally say that I can testify to you that after two and a half decades of study of the Christian scriptures, and defense of them against leading opponents of the faith, the consistency and harmony of the biblical text is one of the most compelling reasons why I believe. The single authorship of the Quran raises questions for me as a Christian relating to the claim that the Quran has eternally existed in heaven. For example, the origination of Surah 33, verses 37 through 38, and Muhammad's marriage to Zainab, the divorced wife of his adopted son Zayd, is just one example that we could look at, that a Christian would look at this and go, how can this be something that was eternally found in heaven when it seems to be so very much connected to uh, events upon earth? Likewise, since the Quran has only one author, how do we handle those Quranic teachings that Christians would reject as being incompatible with all preceding scriptures? Does the author of the Quran show an accurate knowledge, for example, of the doctrine of the Trinity? Now, this is an important question for me, anyway. For we must oddly, honestly admit this evening that most Muslims understand the Quran to soundly condemn the central elements of the Christian faith, in particular, the Trinity and the deity of Christ. Such beliefs are described as blasphemy by the Quran, an excess in religion, shirk, unbelief, and those who believe such things will experience the fire. Note the words of just one section of Surah Al-Maida, Ayah 72 and 73. They do blaspheme who say, Allah is Christ, the son of Mary. But said Christ, O children of Israel, worship Allah, my Lord and your Lord. Whoever joins other gods 
to the law. Allah will forbid him the garden. Fire will be his abode. There will, for the wrongdoers, be no one to help. They do blaspheme who say Allah is one of three in the Trinity. It's literally the word three. For there is no God except one, Allah. If they desist not from their word of blasphemy, verily a grievous penalty will befall the blasphemers among them. Now these are strong words, so it is quite proper and necessary to ask the simple question, does the Quran ever accurately define the Trinity? Having examined all possible texts related to the subject, I must conclude that it does not. And some passages, such as Surah 5, 116, seem to present a completely erroneous understanding of the doctrine of the Trinity. Note the words found in that text. And behold, Allah will say, O Jesus, the son of Mary, didst thou say unto men, Worship me and my mother as gods in derogation of Allah? He will say, Glory to thee, never could I say what I had no right to say. Had I said such a thing, thou wouldst indeed have known it. Thou knowest what is in my heart, though I know not what is in thine, for thou knowest in full all that is hidden. Now, many Muslims believe that the Trinity represents God the Father begetting a child by Mary. Ahmed Didat many times misrepresented the Trinity in this way, assuming Christians believe Jesus is an offspring of God, a separate God, one God amongst three. Nothing could be farther from the truth, and one thing is quite certain. What Christians believed about the Trinity was well known in the year A.D. 600. So even if one disagrees with the Trinity, surely what it is is just as knowable and understandable as what Taweed is to a Muslim. So what is this text talking about? That is a subject that we must discuss. But time is fleeting, so our third contrast, and that is the person of Jesus. Jesus appears in the Old Testament prophetically, long before his advent. He is the central character of the New Testament as the eternal Logos made flesh, as we see in John 1.14. The incarnation is a key difference between us. Christians believe God, who created all things, can enter into his own creation for his own purposes and his own glory. The incarnation is definitional for the Christian faith, but it is rejected a priori by Islamic theology. Yet it was plainly taught in the earliest Christian scriptures and was surely a part of the Injil that Christians are exhorted to believe and judge by in such places as Surah 547. Jesus' ministry is firmly rooted in history, his crucifixion and resurrection formed the very cornerstone of the faith. The Christian proclamation has always been that Jesus died at a particular point in time before many witnesses and rose again the third day. This is not just a myth, a religious story. It took place in history. And every single source rooted in the first hundred years after the crucifixion verifies that claim. The titles given to Jesus in the New Testament include Son of God, the only Son who is God, the Monogenes Theos, John 1, 18. The I Am, the Alpha and the Omega, the Lamb of God, the Lord of Glory, the King of Kings, and the Lord of Lords. Muslims often express the idea that Jesus does not view himself as anything but a mere prophet, a mere Rasul. Yet in the Gospel of Mark, at his trial before the Jewish authorities, Jesus drew from the Jewish scriptures and said about himself, quote from the Gospel of Mark, Again, the high priest was questioning him and saying to him, Are you the Christ, the Son of the Blessed One? And Jesus said, I am. And you shall see the Son of Man sitting at the right hand of power and coming with the clouds of heaven. The Jewish leaders reacted with immediate charges of blasphemy. Why? Because they knew the source of Jesus' claim in the prophecy of Daniel. Daniel chapter 7, beginning of verse 13. I kept looking in the night visions, and behold, with the clouds of heaven, one like a son of man was coming. And he came up to the Ancient of Days and was presented before him. And to him was given dominion, glory, and a kingdom that all the peoples, nations, and men of every language might serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion which will not pass away, and his kingdom is one which will not be destroyed. That is why the Jews understood what Jesus was saying to him and accused him of blasphemy. The crucifixion and resurrection of Jesus becomes the very center point of history itself in the New Testament narrative. In the cross, God glorifies himself by redeeming an undeserving people unto himself. Jesus voluntarily goes to the cross. He gives his life freely so that those who believe in him may have eternal life. His perfect sacrifice frees those who believe in him from sin and gives to them eternal life. For the Christian, Jesus as the God-man is prophet, priest, and king. 
As our high priest, he ever lives to make intercession for his people, guaranteeing to them the benefits of his death. The Bible teaches we are united to him in his death, burial, and resurrection, so that his resurrection becomes the guarantee that we too will rise and enter into the rest of God, all due to what he has done on our behalf. This is why Christians seek to live holy lives, not to earn salvation, but to glorify out of a heart of love the one who has saved us. Now, looking at the Quran, Isa appears 25 times in the Quran by name, only once in an identifiable location when he is speaking from his cradle. Most scholars believe that that story in Surah 19 is from the Arabic infancy gospel, originally written in Syriac in the 5th or 6th century. He is virgin born, he works miracles. He is, however, not the Son of God in the Quran, nor does he die upon the cross. In fact, as Cambridge scholar Tarif Khalidi has written, the Quran of Jesus is in fact an argument addressed to his more wayward followers intended to convince the sincere and frighten the unrepentant. As such, he has little in common with the Jesus of the Gospels, canonical or apocryphal. The Quran's denial of the crucifixion is particularly troubling historically as there are few events in history so compellingly witnessed to. Only one ayah in all the Quran denies the crucifixion, a total of 40 Arabic words with no commentary in the Hadith. No Muslim for over 200 years after Muhammad remembered a single thing he ever said about Surah 4, 157. I find that striking as the Quran and Hadith are clear in their commentaries about other areas of difference with Christians, yet on this one topic, all is silence. Surah 4, 157 has engendered many different interpretations amongst Muslims and is in itself hardly mubinu, it is hardly clear. This is a very important issue as well. So, in conclusion, Muslims and Christians, what do we need to discuss? We need to discuss the text of our scriptures. Christians invite open examination of the history of their text, while at the same time rejecting mere naturalistic explanations and materialistic scholarship. We as Christians and Muslims share a worldview that is not limited to the merely natural. We should be very careful to draw from scholarship both in the defense of our own faith and in the criticism of the other's faith, that which is consistent with a supernatural worldview. I have often noted that much of modern Islamic writing about the New Testament, for example, draws from atheistic or secularistic scholarship, Bart Ehrman, for example, rather than from scholarship that would be consistent with an Islamic worldview. This situation should not prevail in our discussions with one another. We should also discuss the authorship of our scriptures as well as the relationship that exists between them. Remember, the Quran makes reference to the Torah and the Injil. And finally, we need very much to discuss the person of Jesus and especially the Islamic denial of well-founded historical realities regarding Jesus' teachings, his crucifixion, and his resurrection. And so we begin our dialogue this evening by focusing upon the key issues. We as Christians and Muslims have an opportunity to demonstrate for the whole world that we have the ability to dialogue with respect, to dialogue with grace toward one another without compromising the truth, while focusing upon what is really important. And I cannot tell you how exciting it is to me to see this room filled with people, and I think it's very obvious, filled with a majority of Muslims this evening. And so I am honored that you are here. I am honored that Imam Shamsi Ali is here. And I hope that our time will indeed be a blessing to all who have gathered. Thank you very much for being here. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. In the name of God, our Creator, most gracious, most merciful. Let me begin by greeting you all with the peace greetings, the greetings of all Prophet, Abraham, Moses, Jesus, and Muhammad, peace upon them all. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. It is indeed an honor for me to be a part of this evening discussion, especially as my friend Dr. James White had debated over 70 times his opponent. And I have to acknowledge that this is my first time. The topic of our tonight's discussions, or we may call it debate, is Al-Quran and the Bible. 
I'm certain that any religious belief should be based on solidly on its holy book. Our case as Muslims, we do believe that every single religious act, every single re of religious practices in our religions is based on the Quran and the interpretation of Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. We do pray five times a day, we have fasting, zakat, charity, hajj, all these are based in the Holy Quran. And I hope that our Christian friends, religious practices also are based on their Bible. Because if you don't find the best in the Bible of what you do in your churches, then how could it justify that these are religious practices? Before going into my specific points on the subject, let me remind ourselves again that Muslims will not be Muslims without believing in Jesus as one of God's mighty prophets and believing in the book which was revealed unto him called Injil Gospel. In fact, we find beautiful stories of Jesus and his mother in the Holy Quran. And I would like really to suggest my friends, Christian friends, to read, especially chapter number 3 and chapter number 19 of the Holy Quran. According to Jesus Christ, I would like to mention just one of the verses in the Holy Quran. God says, and he, God mentions to us, that when the angel came to Mary to tell her that soon you are going to conceive, you are going to be pregnant, she said, Lord, as the American people today say, God, oh gosh, as you change the word God to gosh these days, oh God. How come I'm pregnant? No man ever touched me. So the angel responded to her and he said, That is very easy for your Lord. If you wanted to do something, you just simply say, Kun, and it is, be, and it is. And then the angel described Jesus Christ to Mary with these verses. He said, And God will teach you the book and the wisdom. The law and the gospel. And as a messenger, a rasul, an apostle, to the children of Israel with this message, the message of Jesus. I have come to you with a sign from your Lord, in that I make for you out of clay, as it were, as Dr. Jim mentioned, the miracles of Jesus Christ. And I heal those who born blind and the lepers. And I quicken the dead by God's permission. And I declare to you what you eat and what you store in your houses. Surely there is a sign for you if you did believe. And I have come to you to confirm the law which was before me and to make lawful to you part of what was forbidden to you. I have come to you with sign from your Lord. This is what Jesus said. So fear God and obey me. It is God, Allah, who is my Lord and your Lord. Then worship Him. This is the way that is right straight. This is what the angel told to his mother, that this is Jesus Christ is coming to tell the people. Now regarding his mother, I'm, I'm not going to recite the whole ayah talking about her, but the Quran says, Kanat Siddiqa. His mother was a woman of truth. And of course regarding the angel, it is very clear and mentioned many times in the Holy Quran. But one first that I would like to mention in Surah number 3, chapter number 3, God says, and he sent down the Torah and the gospel prior to this, prior to the Holy Quran, as a guide to mankind. And he sent down the criterion, and it's the Quran. Now my friends, brothers and sisters, Muslims and Christians, having said that, Al-Quran is the criterion that we call for Quran. It's very open and honest as well in the way he, it criticized the many verses of the Bible that were certainly believed to be man-made verses. And I have to be very honest on this. As well as additions, alteration, fabrication that have taken place throughout the Bible many times revisions. And so God the Almighty tells us in the very in a very strong statement in the Holy Quran, chapter number 2, 7779. He said, Don't they know what they conceal and what they reveal? This is for the scholars. They wrote the Bible. They conceal something, they keep something. And then the Quran says, and there are among them illiterate who know not the book but desires, and they do nothing but conjecture. 
for lay Christian people. They have sentiments. Coming to the churches, listening to, listening to the priests, listening to the pastors, they have sentiments. But basically, did they ever ask and question the pastors and the priests? In my experience in Imam in different masajid, in different mosques, if no Muslim ask me after my speech, I challenge them to ask questions. You can ask any Muslim here, mostly coming from three mosques that I'm leading these days. I challenge them. I ask my Christian friends, is there any of you challenge the pastors and the priests after their speech, after their speech? Because you have conjecture, basically my brothers and, and sisters. So what the Quran says here, then woe to those who write the book with their own hands, and they say, this is from God. To traffic it with the miserable price, famine and qalib. Woe to them for what their hands do right, and woe for the gain they make thereby. Now my friends, before I go further, I apologize from the bottom of my heart. If any of these coming statements may be offensive to you, but I'm sincere and I'm honest, and mostly I base my statements on the verses of the Holy Quran. Let me just mention once again that I am not an advocate of debate. You can search my name either in the internet or anywhere else. I am an advocate of dialogue. But for a Muslim, we cannot run away from a challenge, to be a challenge. And they have to call me and they say, I'm ready, say, I'm ready. And so the Holy Quran told me, and argue with them in ways that are best, I mean honesty, sincerity, and straightforward. Don't go around, don't lie. Just tell them as it is. So I'm going to tell you whatever I understand about the Quran and the Bible. Now my presentation tonight, of course, in talking about the Quran and the Bible, just two aspects. Number one is historical backgrounds, and I think Dr. James talked a lot about that. And number two is about the content of each book. Here, we are going to discuss several topics, basically. Number one, its message. What each holy book contains, or contains in regard to the most principles of religious belief. What the Quran says about God. What the Quran says about principal religious practices in our religion, prayer. Now what the Bible says about God. What the Bible says about our Christian friends' religious practices in the churches. Do the Bible say sing songs? Do the Bible say take some instruments, bring to your churches? We will see that. The second one is we are going to see contradictive things. Do we find contradiction in the Holy Quran? And also we are going to see that in the Bible as well. And number three. We will see some samples of the harmony between God's words and God's creation. What does it mean? God, my friends, has two things as a guide for human being, beings to understand Him, to know Him. Number one is written signs. This is called ayat. We have verses in the Quran or in the Bible. But number two is created signs. These two, the written, the said, Signs and the created sign must not contradict each other. We are going to examine that. What the Quran says about those and what the Bible says about those. And the last one is, for the second point, how the message is presented. And here we will examine the contents of each book to see if those messages can be appropriately attributed to God Almighty. The stories of many beloved prophets in the Holy, in the Holy Bible, for example, we are going to see that. Prophet David, Prophet Solomon, Prophet Lot, Prophet Noah. We are going to see all these stories and think about it. Is this an appropriate story to be attributed to God and to His prophets? You're going to see that. The first point tonight, the historical backgrounds of the Holy Quran. How did the Holy Quran, or how was the Holy Quran transmitted into the present day? And how the Bible was transmitted into the present day? First one is the Holy Quran. The Holy Quran is the most widely read book in the history of mankind. You can imagine, my friends, that Muslims pray five times a day. Over a billion Muslims pray five times a day. And every time we pray, we recite the Holy Quran. The most read, I can challenge you, if any other book is read more than the Holy Quran. A source of immense inspiration, guidance, and wisdom for over 1.5 billion Muslims all over the world. It is a miracle of all miracles. And in the last more than 14 centuries, it has been proven to be all times miracles based on the challenges of its, its contemporary. In the time of Prophet Muhammad, peace upon him, the challenge to the Holy Quran is about language. 
and the Holy Quran challenge the capability of the Arab to speak Arabic language. And that's why if you read the Holy Quran in Arabic language, there are certain Ahraf al what we call Ahraf al Alif, Lam, Mim, Hamim, to challenge the Arab people. You speak Arabic language, you are so capable in Arabic language, if you can produce just one chapter of the Holy Quran, do so. No one can ever produce so far in Arabic language. It's a challenge, it's a marathon, in, even in language. And secondly, we are going to say, to see also, that today's contemporary challenge to the Holy Quran is about science. What the Quran says about different proved scientific data that have been proven by different scientists today. We are going to see that. Now the Holy Quran is believed by Muslims and even by some non-Muslims to be the words of God revealed, by Prophet, revealed to Prophet Muhammad and was recorded from the very beginning of the revelation to the end, both by memory and in writing. Both these methods of record started during the life of Prophet Muhammad and the life of his followers, how? Dr. James mentioned about Uthman time. We are going to mention some others basically before that. In fact, Prophet Muhammad himself dictated each verse and each surah, each chapter, how to place it, where, how to start, how, what is the second, what is the third, what is the end. So none of those Sahaba, the followers, even innovated in the Holy Quran. Everything is dictated by Prophet Muhammad through inspiration. This is what the Muslims believe. In the hadith, Ibn Abbas report, that Uthman ibn Affan said, when the Prophet received a revelation, he would call a companion to write it down and tell them where to place the verse in the Holy Quranic order. This mentioned the Council of Amal. And so it is undisputable that the Holy Quran has been recorded since the lifetime of Prophet Muhammad. As the points Dr. James mentioned, I'm going to, to respond to that in my rebuttal time because this is my presentation, so I don't want to waste my time. Now, in the time of Khalifa Abu Bakr, the first caliph, the first Muslim leader when Prophet Muhammad died, there is a problem at the time took place. That there is a war called Yamama battle. And there was a lot of Muslims who memorized the Holy Quran died at that time, more than 70. So Umar was so concerned, he came to, the, to, the, to, to Abu Bakr and said, or oh, oh, Caliph, or oh, Amir al-Mu'minin, or oh, the Muslim leader, many Muslims who memorized the Holy Quran died. Why you don't compile the Holy Quran in one volume, in one holy book, in one book? Because at times it is scattered to different, in the, in different materials. And Abu Bakr accepted that, and this is the beginning of the compilation of the Holy Quran in the form of a book in the time of Abu Bakr. Just years after Prophet Muhammad died, basically. Now coming to Uthman also, when Uthman became the leader of the Muslims, the Muslim state expanded to many places, including Azerbaijan, Ukraine, and all these places, basically. So what happened is, many newcomers to Islam did not understand Arabic language. So when they recite Arabic Quran, they recited on different pronunciations. Dr. J mentions version, version, versions. I think there's a difference between pronunciation and version. We're going to talk about it. We're going to, we're going to, to, to respond to that question, to that point, basically. But my point here, that even the time of Umar, it was not a new version of the Holy Quran written by Umar Allah and by the Sahaba that he assigned Zayd bin Thabit, Zubair, uh, Abdullah bin Zubair, Sa'id bin Al-As, Abdurrahman bin Harith. These are the four individuals assigned by Umar to record the Holy Quran when those 70 Sahaba died in the Battle of Yemen. Now my brothers and sisters, my, the point I'd like to mention here, that I can assure you that throughout the history, and I hope though I have those Quran but I don't know how many of those, uh, one, two, three, four, five. All those five Arabic Qurans were printed in different countries. I wanted to show me any one word that different. <laughs> printed in Pakistan, in India, in Syria, in Indonesia, and here in the United States. Show me any one word in the, those Arabic Qurans are different. You will not find it. While I bring with me different Bibles here, different versions, including the new one that has been presented to me by Dr. James, I can assure you a lot of difference. I can read it to you tonight even. But let me just come directly to the Holy Bible. Let me begin by quoting the most widely used version of the Bible today called the Revised, the revised Standard Version. The authors wrote the following, and I'm just reading to you. You can go to the, to the, author, to the Revised Version and read it. 
The revised standard version of the Bible is an authorized revision of the American standard version, published in 1901, which is a revision of King James, published 1611. The King James version had to complete to compete as to complete with the Geneva Bibles, 1560, in popular use, but in the end it prevailed. And for more than two and a half centuries, two and a half centuries, you can imagine. And these days, Dr. James White basically criticized this Bible, King James Bible. For more, more than two and a half centuries, Christians have been misled by the King James Version. And Dr. James criticized this. But what did the new version says has great def defect. Not only has great defect, so many and so serious. The problem that King James has, so many and so serious. So this is the new one, the American Standard Version. But what happened is, again, the task was undertaken by authority of the Church of England in 1870, that the English Revised Version of the Bible that was published in the American Standard, sorry, new KL. Another, another revisions have been conducted, and it was the council appointed a committee of scholars to have charge of the text of the American Standard Version and undertake inquiry as to whether further revisions is necessary. In other words, King James were revised. Now the new revision is coming. The committee appointed scholars to revise the new one again. I'm not going to read all this, but my point to you that all these revisions are in indications or indication very clearly that there's a lot of changes and in fact some some verses were taken from King James and later on the new revision is again inserted in if the book of God that you took out you put it in again you took it out again you put it again what kind of holy book are you talking about basically please show me in the Holy Quran that these verses have been taken out and again it's inserted in to the Holy Quran. So my friends, we Muslims believe that the Gospel, the Angel, is the book of God that has been given to Jesus. But unfortunately it has been gone through revisions and so many many, if not the majority of the verses of the Bible are basically human mad verses. Now, Coming to, to, that, to another important issue is about the authors of the Bible. For the Holy Quran, we are very clear. <clears throat> Muslims has no slight doubts and we don't question who authored the Bible. But the Holy Quran... Sorry about that. <laughs> While the Holy Quran witnessed to itself as the Word of God, the authors of the Holy Bible are mostly or almost all of them are not known. Now about the Holy Quran, what God says, نَحْنُ نَزَّلْنَا عَلَيْكَ الذِّكْرَ وَإِنَّا لَهُ لَحَافِظُونَ Muhammad, we indeed sent down the book to you. There are many, many verses you can chapter four, chapter number 4 or, or 105, chapter number 65, 55, Ar-Rahman, Allah, al quran the merciful God who taught the Holy, the Holy Quran. Even Muhammad is mentioned, mentioned in the Holy Quran. Muhammad did not speak out of his desires. But it was a revelation given by God. So who is the author of the Holy Quran? The Almighty God. Even Muhammad did not have any intervention at all. But let's come to the Bible now. Who authored the Bible? We see the five, the first five books of the Bible. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. The These five books are commonly related related to Musa alayhi salatu wasalam, the prophet Moses. But let me just tell you, that even Christian scholars today are doubtful about who wrote these five books. Why? There are many verses in, this, in these books are doubtful that Moses had written the books. I'd like to give an example. These verses, listen. And Moses, the servant of the Lord, died there in Moab. Died in the past. Do you think Moses will write that he had died? He died and then he wrote those books? And then he said, he buried him in Moab. He buried him. Who buried him? Do you think Moses wrote this? He buried him? This verse is just simply impossible to be written by Moses. So these five books are written by unknown. Now, even if you, if you read the Revised Standard Version, the books of the Bible, 
The following is written concerning the, concerning the authorship of over one third of remaining books of the Old Testament. Judges, it says, possibly someone, possibly. Ruth, perhaps someone. First Samuel, unknown. First King, unknown. Second Kings, unknown. First Chronicles, unknown. Job, unknown. Exodus, doubtful. All are doubtful, unknown. So who are for these books? Nobody knows so far. When we come to the New Testament, the Gospel, Mark is considered the oldest testament. But again, the Mark which is very popular, it is not the Mark, the disciple of Jesus Christ. At the end, many scholars say that even this name, Mark, is not known to everybody. This is the same issue to the three other New Testaments, my brothers and sisters. So let me end this point with a verse from the Holy Quran, chapter number 378. There is among them a section who distorts the book with their tongues. You would think it is a part of the book, but it is not a part of the book. And they say it is from God, it is not from God. It is they who tell a lie against God, and well, they know it. Some of those people don't know it. It's not the book of God, but they just follow it sentimentally, emotionally. It's tradition we have to follow, we have to believe, either you know it or not. Now coming to the second point tonight that I'm going to mention to you, is about the contents of both books. The most important point of the content is about the principles of religions. When you talk about the Quran, what the Quran says about God the Almighty. When you talk about the Bible, what the Bible says about your God. I'm not going to mention all of you, but in the Holy Quran, everything is clear. It doesn't need any interpretation. From the beginning, Bismillahirrahmanirrahim, in the name of Allah, most gracious, most merciful. Isn't it a very clear concept of God? Alhamdulillah Rabbil Alameen, praise be to the Lord of the universe. He's the creator of the universe. Ar Rahman Rahim, the merciful, the gracious, Maliki Omedin, the king of the day of judgment. Is there anything you need for any interpretation? Everything in the Holy Quran is clear about God. Dr. James criticized a lot of a talk about this. But coming to the Bible, my friends, what the Bible says about God? At the end, it's confusion. Because many, many verses in the Bible clearly, in a very clear, straight point, that God is one. And we can mention that, for example, even Mark 12, New Testament, Mark 12, 29 to 30, what Jesus says, and he answered to his disciples, and Jesus answered him, the first of all commandments is, hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is, is, is one Lord, is one Lord. And thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, and with all thy soul, and all thy mind, and with all thy strength. This is the first commandment. Even Jesus said to his people, there's only one God. And there are many, many verses in the Holy Quran, in the Holy Bible, talk about one God. But suddenly we find today, the Christian concept is about Trinity. That one in three individuals. Where is this coming from? Where is this coming from? Some verses might be mentioned, but let me just give one example because of the time. Matthew 29, 19. What this says, Matthew 29, 19. Go ye therefore, and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. If I say to a Muslim, my brother, go out to preach Islam in the name of Allah, Muhammad, and the truth. Should we believe that they are one God, they are all God in, in, in oneness, in Trinity? Of course not. So Jesus probably say, go and baptize them, go preach the religion in the name of God, and me, as a prophet, that through me, you understand this teaching. So it is not a clear concept, but yet you see that the majority of our Christian friends today believe one in three. So my point here tonight, if the concept of God is not clear in our religion, and it's not clear in the Holy Book, what kind of Holy Book do you expect? Now coming to the second point of the last point I'd like to mention to you, is about the context of both the Holy Quran and the Bible, contradictions. Of course, Dr. James might provide again that it is a forced contradiction that might be according to his understanding that these are contradiction verses. He can provide it to me, I can respond it later on. But I can assure you that from the beginning until the end of the Holy Quran, you will never find any contradictions. 
Because there are two possibilities here. Let me just give you an example. If God says the Shamsi Ali is an American, okay, tall, blue eyes, blonde, and then on the other hand he says, God says, the Shamsi Ali is short, brown, black eyes, black, black hair, an Asian type, this cannot be reconciled. There must be both life or either of one or two or, uh, or and one is wrong. But if God says Shamsi Ali is an American, that might be reconciled. I may be Indonesian born, but I'm an American citizen. Or I have two, do, 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 how do you call double it? Citizenship. Double citizenship. So either you can reconcile the verses of God or you cannot. And we'll see that some. Now coming to the, to the Bibles, I would like just to give you some example, but basically you can, you can, brothers and sisters, you can have a lot of things. Number one, how many stalls for horses did Solomon have? 40,000, king, 15, 30, or 4,000. 40 and 4 is only zero different, but zero makes it big different. Okay, second, how old, how old was Ahaziah when he began to rule over Jerusalem? 22 or 42? The difference is 20. Is 20. The difference one probably is understandable. The difference 20 is amazing. How old was Yahuachim when he became king of Jerusalem? 18 and 8. The difference is 10. Very amazing. Now let me just give you one more example because of the time, because I had more important points to mention. What was the name of King Abijah's mother? Micaiah, daughter of Uriel of Gibeah, Chronicles 13.2, or Macha, daughter of Absalom? How come a person has two mothers? Just imagine in the Bible. These are some and hundreds of contradictions that you can find in the Bible. Can you reconcile these verses? If you cannot, then I, there are two possibilities. Either these, one of these are not words of God. And if you find that words of God in a book, this is not the book of God. Or both are wrong. Because it's impossible that God has contradictory words in his book. Okay? Now coming to the third aspect of the content of the Quran is the words in action about scientific data in the whole Quran. Come in. Two minutes. Brothers, I just give you one example in the Holy Quran. The Holy Quran says that this universe kana karaktal, which one, fafatak krahuma, and suddenly exploded. The scientists found it is the Big Bang. Just one example. We have a lot of you basically because of the time. Now coming to the Bible, I give you one example. Genesis 1, 11, 13, 14, 19. Vegetation was created before sunlight. Is there anything can live without sunlight? Prove to me scientifically that any living creature can live without sunlight. This is scientific Quran and Bible because of the time I cannot mention. But the most important, the last point, my brothers and sisters, is appropriateness to God. Can you relate these stories to, God, to Allah? That these are words of God. Can you relate these stories to the Prophet of God? The best human beings. What God says about Lot in the Holy Quran. He, he, he entered into the cave, slept with his two daughters. And both daughters were pregnant. Do you think God talked about incest in the Bible? I don't, I don't mean to offend you. I'm very sorry about that. The Holy Quran talked about how to rape a sister. You can read Judges 16.1. The Holy Quran talks a lot about pornographic things. I'm sorry to mention this, to mention this, to use this word. But this is the reality in the Holy Quran. You can read Genesis 38-9. 30, and then you can talk about Noah. He was drunk. Now my point to you, my brothers and sisters, if these people, prophets, messengers, the best human beings, committed all this, what kind of message that they deliver to the people? Thank you so much. Ten minutes is a very short period of time. If I could have your attention, please. Uh, numbers of things to respond to here. Uh, I would uh, simply point out that uh, none of the issues that I raised with the early text of the Quran had anything to do, in point of fact, 
with mere pronunciation differences. They were razm differences. They were reading differences in the text of the Quran. Hence, they really are not just matters of pronunciation. Uh, there also was a discussion of how Qurans printed in different places all read the same. That's comparing apples and oranges when you talk about different versions of the Bible. Uh, for example, if you were to uh, compare uh, the Piktal's translation of the Quran with Yusuf Ali's translation of the Quran with Assad's uh, translation of the Quran, that would be a relevant comparison to the various versions of the Bible that are found. By the way, the RSV is in no way, shape, or form anywhere near the most popular translation that is available today. And the vast majority of notes in the RSV are exceptionally liberal and not overly relevant. Uh, Christians, uh, I, I never said that Christians were misled by the KJV. My book is not against the KJV, it is against those who make the KJV the only Bible, including making the English translation superior to the Greek and Hebrew originals. Uh, then we had a discussion of how most of the authors of the Bible are unknown. Well, that's quite true. Uh, the Bible nowhere says that you have to know who the author is for God to give revelation. We believe that revelation comes very differently than Muslims do. This also connects with the last statement about uh, how the Bible is very honest about the sinfulness of men that God used in the past. Yes, the Bible is very honest in discussing those things. That's because that's how we as humans live. Mm -hmm. And the Bible is very straightforward and open about our sin and our need of a savior. Uh, but directly related to this is the idea that if a man is sinful, that revelation couldn't come through him, and that is not anywhere taught in the scriptures. Revelation comes from God. Men spoke from God as they're carried along by the Holy Spirit. It's not their personal holiness that guarantees the truthfulness of the Word of God. It is the Spirit of God Himself. It is interesting that it was pointed out that most of the Old Testament books, we don't know who wrote them. That is quite true. And yet in Sahih al-Bukhari, we are told that when the Torah was brought in before Muhammad, he removed himself from the pillow upon which he was seated, had the Torah placed upon the, uh, the pillow. And what did he say in Sahih al-Bukhari? You Muslims know. He said, I believe all that is in this Torah. Now, we know exactly what the Torah read in the 7th century, just as we know exactly what the New Testament, the Injil, was in the 7th century as well. And it is exactly what we have today. And so if that is going to be a problem, then you have to ask yourself a question. How did Muhammad say, I believe what is in this Torah, when you are saying that because we don't know who the authors are, somehow it is non-authoritative? Mm -hmm. uh, it was mentioned that we have Moses' death uh, mentioned in uh, the Pentateuch. That is quite true. Uh, the idea is that, well, uh, even though Jesus himself identified these as the words of Jesus, and I would assume you would believe that Jesus as a Rasul would not be in error in his statements about this. He specifically said, Moses wrote these things for you, he did these things for you. It does not follow that after his death, someone else cannot compile these things and even record his death and have that to be inspired scripture. Again, there's no objection to be found there. Uh, I think it's a very narrow view of scripture to go that direction. Uh, we had a citation of Mark chapter 12, the Shema, Shema Yisrael, Yahweh Elohim, Yahweh Echad. Hero Israel, Yahweh is our God, Yahweh is one. Echad, the very same term that is found in Surah 112, Ayah 3. Before that it is said that he is Echad, he is one. We believe that God is one. Amen. The doctrine of the Trinity begins with absolute monotheism. We believe God is one. It is a misrepresentation of the doctrine of the Trinity to say that we divide the nature of God up into three separate gods. That's why I raised the issue, does the Quran show an accurate knowledge of what the doctrine of the Trinity is? It was well known at that time. I can demonstrate that beyond all question. So if the Quran is speaking of the Christian doctrine of the Trinity, it should do so accurately in that context. We were asked about what's the difference between 40,000 and 4,000 stalls. It's the exact same difference as I showed you in Surah 3, 158, between whether Allah gathers people or does not gather people to himself. One letter in Hebrew. Remember, Hebrew is a language that used num uh, letters to represent numbers. And so that would be one small difference in the text. We do not say, we do not claim uh, that there are not human beings who were involved in the transmission of the text. My point has always been, there were with the Quran as well. And remember, if you have textual variants in the Quran that has only been around since 632 at the earliest, and you were looking at the Old Testament, which was at that point, that particular section would at least be uh, at least 700 years before Christ, uh, you're looking at 1,300 year difference of 1,300 years being uh, passed on by hand. And once again, since the Lord Jesus himself quoted from the Old Testament and demonstrated it was the very words of God, should we not take his word as final in this? He certainly believed that those things were the, were the case. We also had 
a uh, question about, well, who is the mother of such and such a person? We need to recognize that in the ancient world, genealogies were constructed to make a point. If you compare the genealogy of Jesus and Matthew and Luke, you'll find numerous differences. Why? Because each writer is seeking to make a point. And it was not considered improper, for example, to refer to a grandfather or even a granduncle in a person's genealogy. There are numerous excellent works that have been written on the, the numbers of the Hebrews king, Hebrew kings, the genealogies in the Old Testament, and these things can be demonstrated to be harmonious with one another if you will allow the text to speak for themselves. Now, we, we had the regular uh, assertion, which the Quran itself makes, uh, made concerning, just show us one, uh, one uh, surah uh, that is like unto the Quran. Uh, it simply cannot be done. And, and I, I think some of the statements about linguistic miracles and things like that may have been being referred to there, but it really wasn't brought out. I'd like to read you just uh, one short surah of the, uh, of the Quran and then compare it. Uh, with a section from the Bible. This is Surah 105, uh, and here's what it says. Have you not seen how your Lord dealt with the people of the elephants? Did he not bring their plan to naught? And he sent against them swarms of birds, which smote them with stones of baked clay, and made them like straw eaten up by cattle. There is the entire Surah. Now let me compare that with one of the hymns of the early church, of the Christians. The Carmen Christi in Philippians chapter 2, verses 5 to 11. Have this attitude in yourselves, which was also in Christ Jesus, who, although he existed in the very form of God, did not consider equality with God a thing to be grasped or held on to. But he made himself of no reputation, taking on the form of a servant being made in the likeness of men. And he became obedient, even obedient to the point of death on the cross. Therefore also God highly exalted him and gave him the name which is above every name, that the name of Jesus every knee should bow and every tongue should confess all to the glory of God the Father. I would say to you that since we look at things in a subjective fashion, that we might well demonstrate that that is significantly more superior uh, to what we have in Surah 105. Now I know that there is going to be prayers right after, maybe in between these two uh, 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 We'll finish rebuttals. We will be having prayers. Uh, so uh, if, if you want to just hold on, uh, we'll be able to continue uh, with, uh, with the debate and be able to do that and be able to do prayers afterwards. So uh, it'll, it'll, it'll be according to what the imam is saying. <laughs> so we don't want everyone to be leaving. Now finally, uh, and, and uh, very briefly, and it doesn't look like that's going to stop anybody, but uh, <laughs> I'll continue talking to the rest of the folks. Uh, uh, I did want to make one reference to the assertion that the Quran teaches things very, very clearly, specifically the corruption of the New Testament, and that was in Surah 2, 77-79. I think there's another way of understanding that particular surah, but I would simply like to ask a question of Imam Shamsi Ali, and, and maybe yourself as well, those of you who are still here listening anyways. Uh, and specifically in Surah 5, beginning at 46, uh, well, actually, I'd like to back up. Surah 544, we read, Surely we revealed, we revealed the Torah, wherein is guidance and light. Thereby did prophets who had submitted themselves to Allah judge for the Judaized folk, and so did the scholars and jurists. They judged by the book of Allah, for they had been entrusted to keep it and bear witness to it. So Jews do not fear human beings, but fear me, and do not barter away my signs for trivial gain. Those who do not judge by what Allah has revealed are indeed the unbelievers. It sounds to me like the Jews possessed what God had revealed to him. Certainly Muhammad thought that way when he said, I believe what is in the Torah. And he continues on to say, And therein we had ordained for them a life for a life, an eye for an eye, and a nose for a nose, and an ear for an ear, and a tooth for a tooth. That's from uh, Deuteronomy chapter 20, or Exodus chapter 21. And so the point is that at the day of Muhammad, he is specifically stating that the Jews possessed what Allah had sent, and if they don't believe what has been given to them, then they are unbelievers. So how can we come up with this idea that this has somehow been massively corrupted, when in the days of Muhammad, he seems to believe, he says in the next verses to the people of the, of the gospel, to judge by the things contained therein. If they did not possess the Torah and the Injil, they could not judge by those things. Since we know what the New Testament and the Old Testament was in the days of Muhammad, without question, we have entire copies of the Bible that existed before the time of Muhammad, then it seems to me that this assertion falls upon the consideration of the text of the Quran itself. Thank you very much. Sorry that uh, I, we have to stop, and this is just one of the.